Awesome. Okay. Welcome everybody to Memphis Art and Design Week. I have the luck of being on screen beside Donna Woodley, who is an amazing visual artist and art professor. Um, I got to know Donna a few years ago when we had our second year of Young Collectors Contemporary, and it has been just a joy to get to know her. We've talked quite a bit throughout um, the last six months of quarantine and a lot of the racial injustice that we've seen happening around uh, the country and around the world. And so this uh, talk is is really, really great because she helped me really work through some of the things I was even thinking about. Mm -hmm. And the title for this, Residue of Injustice, came from something that um, Donna said on one of our calls, and it was this term of residue. Um, so this isn't a panel conversation. She is going to take it over. I am just kind of leading into it um, and, and setting the stage, really, because I think the idea of residue um, really set with me, and especially in terms of how it relates to racial trauma um, and what that looks like when you experience it from a young age, like we see so many people, um, so many young folks experiencing right now, and how that's carried through with their artistic practice or even in our lives. In this case, we're talking about that residue affecting her creative practice, but we know that it's showing up even for us as adults in a lot of unique ways. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Donna to talk about her practice and her work. Um, and again, thank you for having us. Thank you for, for coming to Memphis Art and Design Week. Um, you're a Memphis native, and I can always appreciate when artists and creatives invest back into the city um, that they're for. So I'm going to disappear off video and I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Whitney. You are just a blessing. Absolutely. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm glad that you are able to make it. Thank you so much, Whitney, uh, to you and to your team. I'm going to jump right in here because I made some notes uh, that I want to make sure I don't forget. But thank you, Whitney, for um, just accepting me into your wonderful week of Memphis Art and Design. Um, it's, it truly is an honor. I'm happy to be here, um, uh, elated to be here. So um, let's see, I'll go ahead and start here. I'll be hopping off and on because I do want to show a quick video, but I wanted to start off with um, just what it is um, uh, to address in the talk today. Um, so, um, Okay, this kind of all started, we're talking about residue of injustice. And as Whitney said, um, the, the word residue came up for me uh, in that over the years, um, we've had uh, some major tragedies and, and trauma to happen to our family. Um, one speaks uh, in the context of what's been going on currently and over the last few years, um, stemming from anywhere from Trayvon Martin up to Breonna Taylor. Um, and just, I started thinking about how the families move on and how, you know, that people often forget about the families, like, or they may not even think about them, uh, you, you know, uh, consciously um, at all. And, and I thought of this word residue. Um, and then Whitney came up with the, the beautiful title, Residue of Injustice, The Effects of Racial Violence on Creative Practice, and I love it. So, um, so one of the things that I wanted to bring up uh, initially and, and in the beginning of this presentation is the, one of the, the most recent tragedies that, we, that the world got to witness was George Floyd. We, we got to witness this tragedy of George Floyd literally being killed on video for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, that shocked everybody. I, I believe that's safe to say. And then uh, in speaking about how the effects of racial violence take, you know, how it affects our creative practice, um, you start to see artists who make images of and they martyr the people who have been victimized 
Um, and, and I think that that is wonderful. I think that however an artist decides to, to make work in the context of how they want to make it is, is an amazing feat. Um, however, I started seeing things, uh, <laughs> images, and I'm looking for, for, for my image, my cousin, images of my cousin included in that number, and I couldn't find it. So um, this talk is about trauma, uh, the residue that remains, and how that residue has informed my practice. Um, I looked up the definition of residue and it reads as a small amount of something that remains after the main part has gone or been taken or used. I want, uh, I want to talk about the residue of injustice and how it becomes a part of our DNA, if you will. Um, if you think about DNA, we all have DNA and it's specific to each of us individually. Um, with the exception of identical twins, no two DNA profiles are alike. I believe that this is the case for the effects of trauma. Um, our experiences of trauma are specific to us. I don't think that there's any two that are alike, two, two uh, managements that are alike. And how we deal with them are often judged, brushed over, and timed. People say things like, well, that was really a long time ago. Shouldn't you be over it by now? Oh, you're good. You're good. You know how we do. You're good. Man up. That's one of them. Put your big girl panties on. That's another. You know, and to avoid those judgmental and negative directives, some of us grieve internally to where it shapes who we are, and then we make art about it. And that's been my story. So quickly, I'll show you this image first. So this is amazing work. This is an image that um, uh, of an artist, Kadir Nelson, who I follow. I love his work. But again, I I was looking at the image and I'm searching and I'm searching. I'm looking for Ronnie. I'm searching and I'll tell you the story of my cousin here in just a second. But I'm searching. I'm like, where my cousin? You know, at uh, <laughs> or where my cousin at? You know, so I'm just like looking and I'm like, oh man, they left him out. So I felt like it was incumbent upon me to start to really bring awareness to his story. Um, I started a documentary to that effect. Um, I have a lot of raw footage that um, I need to develop, but my goal was to um, really talk to my family about their accounts of what happened and about um, the residue that remained with them, what they remember, how they feel, um, and those sorts of things. So with that, I'm gonna stop the share and move to a YouTube that I want to share with you. Um, here we go. Now I'll just play a, a few minutes of this. Everything to live for. Now they're determined to see that he did not die in vain. Harold Dow has the story. 21-year-old Ron Settles was a star running back for California State University Long Beach, the fifth leading rusher in the school's history. Pro teams like the Dallas Cowboys and Seattle Seahawks showed interest, telling him... to stay healthy, but those dreams were never to be realized. Three months ago, Ron Settles was driving down this street on his way to work. According to the police report, he was doing 47 in a 25 mile an hour zone. When stopped, the police officers claimed Settles resisted arrest and attempted to pull a knife. Police officials admit that the suspect was repeatedly hit in the head as he was being booked. He was eventually taken to the Signal Hill Police Station and confined to this jail cell where police reported Settles committed suicide by hanging himself. His parents refused to believe it and charged foul play. I knew he didn't do it. You know, I, I'll go to my grave saying he did not do it. He did not take his own life. He did not take his own life. He had too much to live for. During a coroner's inquest, all five police personnel involved took the Fifth Amendment. 
After nine and a half days of testimony, the panel ruled five to four that Ron Settles died, quote, at the hands of another. There is no doubt in my mind that this young man committed suicide. Absolutely no doubt. All the scientific evidence points to that fact. It's ridiculous to think that this young man with everything in the world to live for would kill himself over some bogus trumped-up charge. The Settles family has already filed a $50 million damage claim against the city of Signal Hill. In addition, the family also plans to ask the Los Angeles County District Attorney to file criminal charges against it's those individuals the family believes were responsible for the death of their son. Harold Dow, CBS News, Signal Hill. The Los Angeles County Attorney says he plans to investigate five more allegations of police brutality in the town of Signal Hill, California, for a total of ten that he's now looking into. And such allegations are nothing new for Signal Hill. Harold Dow reports. Last June, football star Ron Settle died in a Signal Hill, California jail cell. He'd been arrested for speeding. Police contend he hanged himself with a mattress cover, but a coroner's inquest ruled that Settles did not die by his own hand. But there are now charges that the Settles case was not an isolated incident, charges that it was part of a pattern of police brutality in Signal Hill. Records show 29 lawsuits against Signal Hill police in the last 13 years. Charges of false arrest, wrongful death, and brutality. Sixteen of those cases were settled out of court. Police officer Jerry Lee Brown is the man most often accused of brutality, named in nine suits, including the Settles case. Neither he nor other police will comment on any of the cases, but Brown's lawyer denies the allegation. Here's a man that has laid his life on the line. He's given 11 years to law enforcement and to his community, and then to be tried and dissected by certain news media elements and be animated that he's a murderer or a criminal is just, it's just inexcusable. There isn't that much brutality going on. Of course, everybody gets a ticket as brutalized, uh, according to the paper, and that's not true. But critics charge that Signal Hill, a small oil town run for years by one family, has a long history of hiring police fired by other departments. And local reporters who've looked into the fatality charges claim police have warned them to back off. Because at one point, you know, we're just passed away to the reporter that he, when he was talking to us. At one point, he said, I tell Mary that you would still have more rope up there for him. He's pretty sick. Evidence in the Settles case will be brought before an investigative grand jury later this month. And District Attorney John Vandekamp says he has expanded his probe to include other allegations made against the city's police department. Harold Dow, CBS News, Signal Hill. And this is Darnell and Helen Settles. Um, we got the phone call from the... Okay, I'll go ahead and stop that share. I'm going to check in and make sure everybody is looking at what I'm looking at. So, um, Whitney, can you tell me the video was showing? Were you able to see that video? Yeah, it was perfect. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm learning from my students that I have to check these things, you know. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to my presentation. Uh, current slide. And we'll move on. So, so that is, that was, that, that's one of, the rare videos that's left um, of the story of um, Ron Settles. Um, and so th this is my cousin, this is, this is Ron Settles, we call him Ronnie. Um, he was the oldest first cousin out of us first cousins. And I wanna share what I know of his story and my memories as a nine year old of what happened to him. Um, what is often written is that he was stopped for and, and recorded and reported on is that he was stopped for speeding in Signal Hill, California. And because he was supposedly not cooperative, things like he wouldn't produce his license, um, he resisted, he had a gun, then it went from him having a gun to him having a butcher knife. And it was even said that he had cocaine in his possession, uh, blah, 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 and blah. Um, even though there was, there were um, tests done and showed no drugs in the system. And by the way, that video uh, speak, it, it eerily speaks of in 81, some of the same language that we've heard uh, most recently, which is a shame. Um, I don't believe a word 
of what they were saying about Ronnie and how he reacted uh, to them, I just will never believe that. Um, while I may not have gotten to know him as much as I wanted to in this short time on earth, in his short time on earth, I'll tell you what I remember about him while in his presence. Um, he was the most cool, laid back and confident cousin we had. It made perfect sense that he was the oldest for, uh, out of the first cousins. And even though I was in Tennessee and he was in California, I still felt love and pride for him and all of my first cousins. And I felt very protected by him as a big cousin. We were all very athletic boys and girls in, in our family, very active in sports. And there was something about him that made me look up to him as a leader um, of us in my kid mind. So on June 2nd, 1981, he was subsequently taken into custody by Signal Hill police. And approximately two hours later, he was dead. According to the police, they found him hanging uh, in the jail cell, citing that he committed suicide and citing that he hung himself using a mattress cover. It was later proven through the representation of the illustrious Mr. Johnny Cochran and also the independent autopsy of Dr. Michael Baden that he died at the hands of another. And that's the terminology that was used. So a few things I remember um, that deals with that trauma that we're talking about. I remember hearing the words, Ronnie is dead. I remember he had two funerals. One was in California and one in Tennessee. And I remember as a kid thinking, wow, I never knew that air, an airline can fly a body from one state to another. I remember that. I remember that thought because I was like, well, what happens? How will he get here? You know, that sort of thing. Um, I remember being terrified at his body because he did not look like himself at all. Um, I didn't sleep for about a week. And I remember watching, um, there was a 2020 special about this story about his story. Um, and I remember watching that at my grandparents' home. And so um, in watching it, it's almost, it's, it's interesting because my memories come in the form of me looking down at them. So instead of me placing myself there, it's almost like I'm looking, looking at the scene uh, as a viewer. And, and that's kind of weird, but that's just how it is in my mind. And so I'm viewing my sister and I on the floor at my grandparents' house and my grandparents sitting on uh, the couch, um, uh, across like one couch over here, maybe a chair over on the opposite side and watching, but not knowing that they were going to show his face, uh, deceased face, uh, beaten and battered. And, and then that was a re-traumatizing uh, uh, event for me because um, you know, the, nowadays you watch uh, investigative discovery TV. Well, me, my sister and I, my, all of us, my sister, my mom, and I, we watch that a lot. And so they never, they always blur out the um, the deceased, but they didn't, they they weren't doing that at this time, and so they showed it. Um. So it was close range, uh, in in the, in their effort to talk about how badly he was beaten while in police custody. And so I also remember going to stay, this was subsequent to his murder, going uh, some summers later to stay with my Aunt Helen and Uncle Don in California for the summer. And um, after, uh, upon like getting there and, you know, excited to see them and excited to be in California and stay, um, I remember being terrified, and this is this is not a, a feeling just exclusive to me, but it's it's kind. Of, I found out here late, uh, later on in life that it's it's uh, happened to a couple of my cousins. Um, just terrified to stay in his room, um, although they had transitioned the room to be like a den. Uh, but still, I I was twelve when I went out there, and I could feel his presence and did not know enough at that young, young age to feel that as a good thing uh, and to feel that peace as a peaceful thing because that's, that's the feeling I remember. I just was afraid to stay in the room. So what I did was I slept, I'm a very solution-driven person. I slept on the floor right beside Aunt Helen and Uncle Don 
in their bedroom the whole summer uh, and was super comfortable doing that. So um, th those are the things that I remember. Um, I remember my Aunt Helen passing away and not really understanding some, and this was some years later, maybe seven years later after Ronnie died, um, not, uh, not knowing how it was that she could pass away because she was healthy. But, um, but we uh, later on understood and, and have been told that, you know, she literally died of a broken heart because that was her only son. So stress, stress took over. So the one thing that I want to point out in, in this tragedy is that there, there are images that show, that pretty much represent the story, but they don't represent the entire story. And so these are some images that I found online when um, I did a couple of searches of Ronnie's name and included Signal Hill in with his name. Um, there aren't any action images of him on the football field or baseball field. There are no images of his car, which he loved. It was a sport. It was kind of like a sports car and no images of him coaching little kids. As my understanding is he was on his way to his coaching job when he um, had been stopped by the Signal Hill police. So this is what remains of his story online. It's it's rallies, which those are, are very good things, and, and the quest for justice. Um, it's pictures of my aunt and uncle in the media. Um, and then it's stories like the one that I just showed you um, here at the bottom, uh, telling of that tragic uh, day. Now, here are some other pictures that I was able to collect from, um, from my family, a few of those. Um, and the ironic thing, if I go back and forth, uh, not forward, uh-oh, sorry. <laughs> if I go back and forth, um, the ironic thing to me is that um, all of the pictures that I found on the internet about Ronnie, Uncle Don, and Aunt Helen are in black and white which that kind of takes some of the life out of it, um, metaphorically. Um, and these family pictures are so colorful um, and vibrant. And it shows, in my opinion, the full picture. So um, I just wanted to include some of these. Uh, these. These are pictures that I'm working with in some new work uh, that I'll show you here in a minute. But um, they represent family reunions, they represent anniversaries, they represent happiness, they represent a feeling of uh, uh, being carefree. Um, it, it's, it's, I won't say it's void of trauma, but it's void of, of tragedy. Um, it's void of tragedy. And I wanted to pull up these pictures because these are years later, subsequent to um, Ronnie and Aunt Helen's death. I do, I can't remember whether Uncle Donnell was alive uh, as it pertains to the timeline for the picture on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, but um, I know that Aunt Helen was, was um, deceased at this time. So these are family pictures that have great memories attached to them, but they are also a very clear reminder of who's absent. Um, when Aunt Helen was alive, if Aunt, if Aunt Lily and Aunt Glenda were in Tennessee, which they at one point in time lived in California, um, my mom lived in California at one point in time, but they, they all would be together. So during the time that my mother moved back to Tennessee, um, my Aunt Helen, Aunt Lily, and Aunt Glenda were in California. At some point in time, Aunt Glenda moved to Colorado, but whenever they came to Tennessee, they all came. And so to see pictures without her is a reminder that she's no longer here. And that is grief and that is trauma because of the, the reason why she's not here. 
So I thought this image was interesting. I don't know if anybody on the call has ever seen it. Um, this is not my image. I, I happened upon it on social media uh, at the point that George Floyd was murdered. Um, while it, it, it does feel good to see Ronnie remembered in, in some ways, uh, in this way, um, I know that there are others who feel similar to me about their loved ones um, who have faded with time. And then there comes this idea of, of, of a dash. So if you notice up top above the image, I've just, I've just inserted a dash there. Um, initially, I was gonna put Ron Settles to the last person that um, in the news that has been murdered uh, by the police. And then I just didn't think it would do anybody any justice to do that because there are people prior to Ronnie and there are people after George Floyd and after Breonna Taylor, certainly. So I wanted to just leave the two sides open. I wanted to leave those two sides open as a way to honor those people. Okay, so now moving to how trauma can inform our practice and work. Um, these are some images. Some of them I've, I've shown you in the previous slides, but um, they're, they're images that I'm working with. Um, I believe that trauma shapes who we are and it's inevitable that it can inform our work as artists, even if that means not addressing it. So not addressing trauma it is, an, is a way of being informed of or it's, it's a way of being affected by trauma. I can say that it, it has informed my work in that I think that it's safe to say that the content of my work will always include ideas and narratives about Black culture, good, bad, and indifferent. I learned to take those things that we have been socialized and that we have been conditioned to, to to think negatively about and to down ourselves on, such as names, such as different skin tones, um, such as hairstyles, and our creativity is, has not been uh, celebrated in American society, especially during the times of uh, post-civil rights, um, even up to the 90s and even, even now. Um, so I decided just to celebrate them no matter what. Um, for instance, when I take role in my class and I have a student uh, named Godsent or Demario or Monica, um, number one, I wanna learn how to pronounce their name properly. So I, I generally ask them is that it, I'll pronounce it and then I'll say, is this the proper way to pronounce your name? Is this right? Um, they'll say yes or no. And I'll say, well, tell me if they say no, tell me how to pronounce your name. Oh, okay. It's this. Okay. All right. If I pronounce it wrong again, let me know so I can get it right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's important to me. I, I celebrate um, our names. I, I, I want to celebrate our creativity, our names. I want to start to change the way we think about those things. And I'm not knocking that we had to figure out a way to survive in this society by conforming um, in a way. Um, that, that's survival, that, that is survival from trauma. Um, so I'm definitely not knocking that, but in order to change something, you have to start to speak it, speak the change. Um, so I absolutely love these names. I love the creative names. And my work speaks to that. So this series is called um, Memories and Reality. Memory and Reality. And um, I thought this quote was interesting. I was talking to one of my uh, former professors, now colleague, and uh, we were doing a studio visit and I wanted to show him what I was doing with the photos. And so um, the quote says, there are three deaths. Um, the first is when the body ceases to function. The second is when the body is consi uh, consigned to the grave. The third is that moment sometime in the near future when your name is spoken for the last time. 
um, I translate that as, or I, I understood that as when, when, you're, when you're essentially forgotten by somebody, okay? So what I did was I wanted to take photos and I wanted to, um, I wanted to do an exercise of the photos. Um, there, family photos are super important. I feel for people who die, who, whose family photos uh, are destroyed in fires, because that's what we have as a source of memory and a source of uh, nostalgia, if you will. So this first one is of my grandfather. This is my mom's dad and um, uh, near and dear to me and to all of us. He was a patriarch of our family. And so my exercise was to take each and every picture that I had and that I had um, gathered from family members and anybody who at this time is deceased, then I essentially go through this exercise of, um, of erasing them from the photo. So, um, so that being said, oh, let me say this before I move on. Well, I'll come back to it. So this is this is the this is the result of um, erasing them from the photo. Now that that's a strange process. Let me just say that that's a, that's a, when I started doing this, I felt some kind of way, um, particularly with my granddad. Uh, that 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 was tough. So, um, but it, it was something I committed to. So um, let me just mention how this process, metaphorically, it changed the composition of um, the photo. It, it, and it's just interesting how it affected the it, it's a it's a uh, a human uh affect and then it's also uh an artistic affect so it changes the whole composition it it makes the the end result or the second image look totally different it changes the elements of design or art it changes the principles of design um and, and it it mentally just you know it changes the way you think about uh, death and, and death being final. Okay, so here is a picture of my mom is on the left and her two sisters. My, uh, I'm not sure who that is in the back, um, but my mother's on the left with the hat on, my Aunt Hazel, and then my Aunt Helen, um, who was Ronnie's mother. And in this picture, um, I had to remove on Helen. And so I'm hoping here that you see what I mean as far as uh, changing the composition. It, it, it essentially throws the balance off uh, because everything, the visual weight is all from the center to the left. It's, there's, there, it's very light on the right side. Okay. Um, so here's, um, on, let's see, from the left to the right, uh, we have my Aunt Glenda, my mom's oldest sister, my uncle, we call him Uncle Strong, but Uncle Ernest, uh, Uncle Strong, uh, older brother. I'm, I'm speaking from my mom, uh, who, how they're related from my mom's perspective. And then my Aunt Hazel, and then Aunt Helen, and then the child in the picture is Ronnie. Um, so, uh, I had to remove some people. So in this picture, uh, Glenda Strong and Hazel remain, but Ronnie and Helen are, um, taken away. And okay. in, in this photo, this is the original photo. So this is my uncle Ken, who um, he is Aunt Glenda's husband. Um, that's Ronnie. Uh, and this is from left to right. Um, that's that's Ken. That's Ronnie. Uncle Larry, 
and then Uncle Strong. So Uncle Ken, Ronnie, Uncle Larry, Uncle Strong. And then I've had to take two people away. Okay. So um, so the, these are the last of the photos that, or these are the, the last, this is the last um, part of this series that I have to show today. But, um, but that, it, that, this has been an interesting process. I, I completed the adjustments to the photos through um, Photoshop. Um, and it was just a, um, it, it really was just an interesting process and talk about, I would say this was, that trauma was pretty much in the forefront of my mind as it pertains to this particular series of work because it's very personal. Um, I think that every family uh, or most families, I should say, have photos that include people that are no longer with us. And so when you um, go through a process like that, it is just something that um, is not, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and then it's labor intensive too. So you stay in it for a minute, right? You mentally, it, it makes you mentally stay in it because you physically, I, I was a new Photoshop user. So, so we had to figure out, oh, okay, I can't, you know, oh, I can't, ah, use the wrong button, sorry. I can't, I got to figure out how to get the truck out because I can't create a truck in Photoshop. I don't know how to do that. What about the Cadillac? Well, maybe I could like do the, the, um, the clone stamp or, you know, something like that. But I had to figure out how to, um, how to come up with uh, another image that would work. And so I just took all of everything from the, the, from Uncle Larry's, uh, body to the left out, including uh, our, my loved ones. So um, that one is directly informed, this, this group of work is directly informed by loss and, and reality and memories and trauma. Um, and, and then it's that residue, like the, the residue I've been talking about all along, because it's those thoughts that kind of shape, um, who you become, uh, like I'm a very cautious person. I'm a worry ward, you know, those sorts of things. Um, I don't think I started out that way, but I do believe that the trauma comes from, uh, or the, the, the characteristics of a person can come from trauma and then from an artist's perspective that essentially comes out in the work. For me, the connection uh, between this particular trauma in my family personally and what I talk about in my work is directly associated with it because uh, Black people have been marginalized, stolen from, and um, appropriated and um, ignored, seen as invisible, seen as less than human, you know, for many, many years now. Um, so my dedication as a result of my family trauma of the injustice of my cousin being killed and um, stereotyped uh, it is to talk about all of the, the trauma and the things that we've experienced um, collectively. So that being said, I wanted to just move on and I will, I'm trying to keep the, I want to keep the time. I'll talk about five minutes about some additional works. Uh, and then I wanted to leave about, if that's okay, Whitney, I wanted to leave about 15 minutes to talk, to open it up for any sort of questions that might've been put in the chat box. Works for me. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, um, this, this series of work, this is some early work that, um, and this was work really, uh, my grad school work um, that I did thesis on. Um, and it talks about uh, this idea of the black woman and the idea of feeling invisible in American society. What I decided to do uh, anybody who knows me knows that I, I like, uh, I love humor. And so I 
tend to uh, put a, a, a touch of humor into my work uh, based off of things that I've thought about for a number of years now. And so in these series of work, they're small, they're eight by 10 on uh, oil on board, board. And I got my girlfriends who graciously agreed and let me do whatever I wanted to do to them. I got them in some photo shoots and I put some white granny panties on their heads and wanted to, I wanted to cover their eyes. And so I put myself in that position too. Top to Kalia, she that's that's uh, that's my my body um, and my face. But what I wanted to do was to come up with some of uh, the things that Black women tend to feel in American society. And what I wanted to do also, what I encouraged them to do, was to speak without showing their eyes. I think they did an amazing job. Um, I use the granny panties because number one, I think that that was a humorous uh, type of painting, number one. And then the faces um, also kind of go along with that humor. But what it's talking about is just this idea of visibility, invisibility, absurdness, uh, and hip hop culture. Um, Oftentimes, we as Black women feel invisible. So then, what is what is there to do to make ourselves visible, and and how absurd can we be in, in that quest to gain visibility? Um, also, the reference to hip hop culture is um, the video girl that started to surface in the '90s when gangster rap started to um, appear. And um, I just essentially wanted to change the function of the underwear uh, because the objectification of women in, in these videos, um, they're in the videos, you know, nearly naked and um, not really being seen as a person. So you can learn a lot from a person through their eyes. Um, so I wanted to cover the eyes and then that implies that you leave the private parts exposed because the, the 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 underwear has changed its function okay oh let me go back for a minute um also the names of the pieces are important it speaks to what i was talking about about how i feel about names and the way that we name our our kids um kanisha the civil engineer yashika the marketing director um, and, and the other names all represent this idea of breaking the barrier of uh, being stereotyped and um, which this is true uh, no matter what the name just because your name may be Shantae doesn't mean that you're not a corporate attorney you know um, so I wanted to I thought that was very important in um, naming the work So here is a project that I did some years ago uh, involving names and uh, the, the Microsoft Word program. Um, I started to notice that when you type in certain names, uh, you wouldn't have to, it, it wouldn't put the little red squiggly line under the name like you misspelled it. Uh, that kind of spoke to me because I was, I was like, Okay, so why is it that Beth or Elizabeth or Donna even um, it is automatically in the word bank? What's up with that? Um, and then Kalina, Narkita, um, what are some of the other names I have here? Um, Juanita, you know, those names are, you, you type them in and it gives you that little squiggly line. So what I did was I created like 88 names. I didn't create those names. I, I typed up 88 names and these are all people that I've heard of that I know um, that I've heard of this name before. So I didn't make it up. And then whatever name came out uh, that had the little red line under it, then I put that on a tent card and I drew the little red line 
um, as a means of talking about. And then there were some that did not have that, um, like Madison, you type that in, there's no misspelling there. But isn't that interesting how um, one, like that says a lot. I would think that there's some sort of, I don't care if you have to, if you can add it to the word bank, to your word bank, you add it to your word bank, but why can't it be added universally? You know, like why, that's, that's my issue with, with that. Well, you can add it to the word bank. Well, that's good, but it hadn't always been that way. In the beginning, I don't think you could add to Microsoft Word's word bank. And these things were just left as misspellings, these names. So, um, so I thought that was, that was something that, was, that I wanted to speak on. Um, these are portraits and I'm just going through, um, these are some larger portraits that all have a red scarf that discuss the symbol of the mammy and how black women were portrayed in accordance with that symbol historically. I wanted to render a modern version of a black woman in a headscarf to represent a connection between past perceptions and present perceptions of black women. And again, the names are important. Here's a series um, talking about internal chaos and the taboos of mental health in the black community. Um, there are a series of selfies that I took um, in which uh, they they have some some mis mixed messages, uh, but the overall sense is talking about the the cover up on the outside or you know faking it until you make it. Um, so pretending to feel well when you don't on the inside, and that deals with depression. And then finally, um, this is a series that I've been working with for a, a, like about two, a couple of years now. Um, I wanted to start to uh, explore this idea of royalty as it pertains to the Black community and Black men in particular. And so um, the idea stemmed from one of uh, the gentlemen in, in one of the paintings telling me that I should paint him as a king. And so we laughed about it a little bit and I started thinking and I was like, well, I don't wanna paint a, a, just a painting with a crown, you know, that sort of thing. And so I came up with this symbol for the toilet because people often refer to a toilet as a throne. And so um, I just kind of ran with that. It's not a series that's done yet, it'll be ongoing. And again, I usually paint people that I know because I, I, um, I like to engage myself in the stories of them and, you know, just get, get the feel for who they are and the essence of who they are. So um, this, this says a lot. I want to cut it off right here just because I want to open the floor. Um, thank you for listening. I appreciate being here. Thank you, Whitney, so much. I just appreciate you. No problem. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to drop it into the into the chat or pop on screen. Um, okay, we've got one for you, Donna, from Mary. Um, thank you for sharing. What future projects? My screen cut off. What future projects do you have in mind? Oh, okay. Thank you, Mary, for the question. Uh, thank you for being here too. I have quite a bit. I have started. Um, dealing with uh, the, this idea of COVID and then these messages on masks. So um, I've started a series of portraits uh, that include the mask. Um, and the one that I've done, it, it's, it has a dual meaning. It says, and I've seen people with a mask that says I can't breathe on it. But um, the young lady that I painted, Tequila Johnson, she was she's a she's a social activist in addition to she had expressed herself on social media saying that she wanted to uh, have a portrait done that represented COVID, and she had expressed that she did not like wearing the mask it's annoying but she knows that it's a, a, one of those things that she has to do and so and think she gave me um just the freedom to to do what i do and and 